All right, I think we're live, which is always the thing that makes me a little anxious because you click that button and all of a sudden you're like, all right, everything's live, but you're just kind of like still in your own little world with your <laughs> with your two <laughs> guest speakers. So you're like, oh, I hope yeah. this works. But anyways, yeah. um, to everyone that's joining us today, thank you so much for, for uh, attending. This is a webinar that we've partnered up with OpenView on. Mm -hmm. So the... Um, OpenView published this amazing report that was really focused on the state of the SaaS talent market. And uh, I read it and I'm like, this is absolutely an opportunity to break this down in a webinar format. Uh, they shared so much data and a lot of actionable insights. So I wanted to make this a uh, opportunity to really digest it all and use it for others to benefit from. So that's what brought us together here. We have Steve and Maggie from OpenView. Uh, Steve, why don't you introduce yourself first, then we'll have Maggie after. Sounds great. Yeah, Keith, thanks for, for having us. We're pumped to chat about this. Um, so I'm, I'm Steve Millie. I'm an, I'm an operating partner at the firm, been with OpenView coming up on, on two years, which is crazy, um, just given how fast time flies. But I've been in executive recruiting my, my whole career thus far. So I started at Corn Ferry, very focused on the Fortune 2000 companies of the world and building out C-suite teams there. Uh, and then, you know, slowly but surely made my way to focus more on venture and private equity clients. And that, what, that led me to join True Search, which at the time was a boutique. Um, now they're, you know, top five global firm in terms of headcount and revenue. Um, but we were exclusively focused on venture and private equity backed clients. So got to work with, you know, the open views of the world, Insight, Excel, Sequoia, anywhere from a seed business up through a, you know, private equity buyout. And, over time, got got connected to OpenView and you know, decided to join the team um, to focus on building out our, our talent function, specifically on our expansion team, our, our value add platform. So uh, I've been lucky enough to bring in some folks to help me with that, Maggie being my, my first hire on the team. Um, so we, we focus a lot of our time on executive recruiting um, specifically, but I'll let her introduce her herself. Well, before we get into that, I always like to ask the question, kind of like an icebreaker, what's the one album you take with you if you were alone on a deserted island? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for variety, I think I'll go with one of the Now CDs. I think I had like Now 13 in my car for like six years growing up. And a good mix in the 90s and 2000s. So I'll go with that versus one, okay. one individual. All right, very cool. All right, Maggie, you're up, you're up next. Awesome. Like Stu said, thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. Um, also similar to Steve, I got my start in executive search at another search firm called Rebel One, was working with all VC and PE backed firms as well to help their clients or their portfolio companies, excuse me. Um, and then got introduced to Steve, made the transition to the VC side. I've been here at OpenView as a talent manager for about a year and a half now. Um, I focus on all things exec recruiting um, across our portfolio. So head of VP, C-suite level roles across all different functions. Um, spend a lot of time working directly with CEOs. And that's everything from start of the search through close, coaching uh, portfolio companies along the way. So it's been a blast. All right. How about your album of choice? This is a tough one. Um, I'm going to have to go with the tried and true Taylor Swift folklore. Oh, wow. Okay. I knew that. I knew that was coming. Yes. Yeah. You could have probably guessed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Actually, I, I, I was, had to drive a long distance with my 16 uh, year old daughter this weekend and we were just listening to a random podcast and we listened to the Rolling Stone definitive list of the top Taylor Swift songs and folklore actually was a bunch of them, which I haven't listened to that. I need to check it out apparently because <laughs> Uh, they were just raving about it. Um, it's so, a really anyways. great album. I'll have to listen to that podcast. Yeah, it was good. I'll send it to you. So, uh, well, I want to do like I want to make this a little bit interactive. So, I'm going to do a quick poll with our attendees here, and I want everyone to chime in. Of how many hires are you expecting to make this year for your company? So, you know, the choices are like one to five, and six to ten, and upwards of a hundred plus. So, just get us a sense of what's going on with. Um, the world out there, which we know is incredibly competitive. It's so, so I started recruiting in 1998. So that means it's been what, how many years? Too many to, to count, right? So um, it's never been like this before. So like Steve, like, like 
the market out there? What, like, how, how do you break it down? Like, I mean, since 1998, I've never seen anything like that. It's bonkers. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's the most competitive I've seen in my time doing search. And I think that's a combination of, I think that's due to a combination of just how specifically also looking at like B2B SaaS and the world that Maggie and I and OpenView focus on how those companies have evolved and also just like the general like world has evolved and with recruiting. Um, so I think that, you know, obviously as, as a talent team at OpenView, we focus on really anything related to portfolio hiring that can range from an IC level recruit all the way up through C-suite, some of your most important executive hires that year. And in that, we were finding some, we were starting to find some themes and start to put some of the pieces of the puzzle together. Like, hey, why is this so challenging? Why are things different? Get ahead of those. And finally, we just said, okay, like, there's so much going on here. There's no better way to, to find out like the true find some of these things um, than, than to really dig in and, and set up this report. So I think the, the motive here and, and kind of why we went about developing our first state of SaaS talent report was there was a huge opportunity to dig in not only to you know, what was like the CEO or exec team hiring manager seeing, but also the journey of a candidate on the other side and what they were seeing. So the report has data from both those key audiences and kind of what they're seeing in this. And the data that came out of it was, was super interesting. But I think the, what you know, Maggie and I were, were sitting one day and saying is we saw so many reports and blogs and things come out about how the talent market is crazy, but no one was saying why. And no one was saying like, here's things that we've seen and here's things that you can, you know, your company can improve on or address to put yourself in a better position to, to win talent. So I think that was the idea behind the report. And, you know, there's a few of those things in there we can unpack and you know, it'll be something we'll be doing annually. So excited about great. it. Yeah, that was a great report, um, which you can find on OpenView's website. Um, you know, it's, it's great, well done, very, you know, laid out, very succinct, which we're going to break down a lot of the key topics from that today. And just from the poll. So it's great. We've got, you know, people from all, from early one to five, all the way a hundred plus, and it's, pretty evenly matched. So I think this is super helpful. And even though the report <clears throat> was, um, you know, SaaS, which open is expansion stage software investing, it, this is applicable to any company, whether if you're a marketplace or, you know, I mean, it's the war for talent stretches across all industries. It's not just SaaS, of course. So this is information that anyone can certainly leverage. So, um, all right. So let's break down some of the reports. So, so Maggie, talk about kind of, you know, what were some of the key factors, like, like, you know, some of the things that you were talking about, like, like headcount growth for companies in 2022, like, you know, what are the, some of the key data points that you guys discovered in this report? Yeah, I think kind of the three big ones that really stood out to Steve and I, and we can go deeper into these and others. Um, the first one is that companies are seeing a two times increase in time to hire. Um, this past year compared to other years, um, which is just crazy when you think about how much that pushes out timeline for other things that your company has to achieve, whether that's goal planning, whether that's this person building their own team, everything is, is kind of doubling in time um, that that takes to achieve. Um, so that's really something to consider when you're planning your hires for the year, quarter, whatever it is, and, and kind of proactively starting those searches earlier, um, now anticipating that it's going to take longer. Um, I would say the second one, and, and this has been a hot topic, um, I'm sure not the first one to, to bring this up, but 86% of companies have seen an increase in comp expectations from candidates. Um, and that's some sort of increase. I think Steve and I have seen the increase be pretty significant. Um, it definitely depends on the role, but um, across the board, people are asking for higher compensation. Um, and then the last kind of key stat um, was that 89% of companies are either fully or partially remote post pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, another trend that kind of aligned with our suspicions and what we are seeing, but it was great to kind of get the data to, to confirm that. Yeah. And what about like priority hires, like different stages of companies have different priorities as far as especially leadership hiring so so what's the breakdown there yeah i can do a stab at that i think this was an interesting area for me to to dig into so a lot of 
you know, the conversations I have um, along with Maggie, but with, with new CEOs, prospect companies, companies that just joined OpenView's portfolio, we sit down and we say, okay, what are the key priorities for the year? And OpenView, as you mentioned, we invest in expansion stage software businesses. So we're typically leading series A, B rounds, you know, occasional series C. And a lot of those businesses, you know, how we define expansion stage is, you know, they've established product market fit. They're putting this capital to work on, you know, increasing product capabilities. Um, and, and really like a lot of that falling on to headcount expansion. So you'll find companies and the report breaks us down. And we wanted to focus on this, you know, the sub 5 million ARR and then above 5 million ARR breaking point and what their priorities are. And what was super interesting was that we found that sales hiring, like getting that right sales leadership earlier. So for those sub 5 million ARR companies was the highest priority. And that was the first I've seen that in a report. Um, personally, I think that people associate those super early stage businesses with engineering or product, you know, some, some technical talent. And I, I think we're definitely still seeing that, but I think we've definitely seen a shift in CEO and board prioritization around getting go-to-market right early. Um, and one of those factors I think we've seen when and also interviewing some of these CEOs is that, you know, I think for the most part, you have founder selling in businesses like that early. So, you know, your first, you know, call it 10, 20, 50 customers are coming in large part due to the founder being the brand evangelist and, and really pitching the product because um, you don't have much of a go-to-market team and leadership presence yet. So I think that that's great. And we look for founders who can obviously close, close customers and or bring in people to train closely to do that um, you know, on their behalf. But I think that we found that people were shifting their focus to getting that initial sales leadership earlier in their cycle than versus waiting to later on in future rounds to, to bring that person in and build up that go-to-market motion. So that was really interesting to see. Um, and on the flip side of that, you know, where were these other businesses who are a little bit further beyond that? So as you get in that five, 10, 15 and beyond, uh, a lot of them you know, flagged product. And, and wanting to increase their product hiring uh, capabilities. So I think a lot of the data we saw there was around wanting to continue to increase product features and build products for scale. So at that point, you had that go-to-market repeatability, you have that go-to-market leadership, you're starting to see the scale. And when we bring in more customers, they want to see more features and they want to you know, see more out of the products and you want to continue to expand to be able to bring in different types of customers. Maybe you're expanding more to, traditional enterprise, if you are mid-market, whatever it may be, you need the right product talent there. So I think we saw a lot of those companies are you know, really pushing for those you know, true product leaders to come in for that um, next you know, stage of scale. And you know, the, the one here, where I think it was, doesn't matter if you are a five person business or 5,000 person business, the common theme across all of them is that everyone's struggling with engineers. I think that's um, you know, something that you've seen blog post about we're not the first people to say it we certainly won't be the last uh, I think it keeps a lot of people up at night you know being able to uh, keep up with engineering hiring across all levels that's from IC up through BP level leadership and in the engineering department so um, you know we, that was certainly something that came out consistently across all the data points yeah when you said product leader does that mean like someone who's heading up product management or is that someone handing up product and engineering? Like, is it like, is it tightly defined or is it broader? I'd say it was a little bit more tightly defined for, for this report. Um, we do see some companies pull that all under like one chief product officer, depending on their background and skill set. I think as we, we defined it in this report, it was more that product management and really building out product features, capabilities across that, that team. So more traditional, just, product background. Um, but yeah, I think that, again, the, the emphasis was a little bit more on that leadership feel. So getting the right product person for the next part of the journey. Because on the flip side of you know, some of these founders and early stage team members is, you know, you'll have some founder led sales early on, which is becoming more common that can't scale. So they want to bring in the right go to market motion. But then you also have some people who, you know, the founders stay really closely uh, involved in the development of the product, and that also can't scale necessarily for too long. I think that founders need to find that right leadership at the right point, you know, to create a vacuum and bring other people in to allow their business to scale. They can't possibly be CEO and product leader and sales leader and probably leading up a lot of the recruiting. So 
you have to find the right rhythm to the leadership um, for scale. Well, the we are going to save some uh, time at the end for Q and A. So if anyone does have questions, you can add them to the Q and A function. There's a chat function too. Sometimes people use both, but if you can keep it to the Q and A, I think that would be the easiest. So we'll save some time at the end for that. Um, all right. So one of the things that this report also talks about is the workplace, which I think is one of these things that people uh, have been trying to figure out. They're probably wondering what are other companies doing, right? Everyone, I think people are just talking like, what are you doing? Are you back in the office now? Are you hybrid? Are people expecting, you know, remote? Like what, so, so what, have, what did you discover in terms of the report as it relates to the working environment for companies, both, you know, short and long-term? Yeah, I can, I can take the stab at this first and Maggie, please chime in. But I, I think that, you know, Maggie flagged the stat, 86% of companies are, um, you know, or excuse me, 89% are going to be fully or partially remote post pandemic, right? So I think that we're seeing a shift here. Um, I think we were starting to see that trend pre COVID with a lot of businesses just due to, you know, more flexibility, technology. Um, I think that as it relates to talent and recruiting, what's interesting is that, you know, if you aren't flexible and you aren't one of those companies in that, you know, majority, roughly 90% of businesses who are going to have that flexible platform, you do in, in this market limit your candidate pool. Um, and that's just the, and that's not going to change. You know, some, some businesses are, they do see the benefit of being in the office every day. We have portfolio companies who have taken firm stances on either side. Like you're going fully remote or, or we're going fully back to office. Um, and they're taking that, you know, in, in stride and seeing what they can do for talent. I can say just from seeing those and what we see in the report on the data is that, you know, there are candidates who are looking for particular work setups in, in that workplace environment. They want the flexibility. Um, and maybe that's just having more flexibility around days they need to be in the office versus, you know, hey, we're Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday. Um, or, you know, we have some camps that, you know, say, hey, like, actually, I prefer to go in person uh, or want the flexibility to go to an office. I don't want to be a fully remote employee. So, I mean, it, it's something that's really challenging to get right for some of these businesses. But I think where, you know, based off the data here and what we're kind of pulling out as our general conclusion is that having the flexibility allows you to kind of go on both sides of that versus taking the stance. So I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these companies report back that it's going to be more of that flexible, that flexible work platform um, where there's going to be probably an office presence where you can satisfy the needs of those folks who think that either themselves as individuals or teams are going to be higher performing in person. And also the folks that, you know, maybe you're a Boston based firm and you're the best person you can get for a particular role are in New York and they're just not going to get to Boston you know, on a weekly basis. Maybe it's traveling as needed. And are you willing to make that sacrifice to land the best person? Um, so I think this was an interesting one to see how people are going to respond. You know, as we're getting the other side of COVID, we're getting a little bit more used to COVID having an effect on the workplace. Yeah. Um, to echo what Steve says there, I think the common theme is really that there's an expectation for some sort of flexibility on the candidate side, obviously that differs from person to person. Um, but something I'm hearing more and more from candidates is even candidates that want fully remote jobs are starting to indicate that it needs to be fully remote with a strong culture. It can't just be any fully remote job. They don't wanna still feel isolated even though they can go out into the world now and, and do other things. They're really still taking a long hard look at the culture and how they feel connected to their coworkers even though they're not sitting next to them at a desk every day. So. So kind of the vibe that I'm getting and, you know, I'm not a fortune teller, but it just seems like there's going to be the work environment where it's, um, you know, it's hybrid, but it, it's localized hybrid. Like you're recruiting still regionally and having people come in the office two, three days or whatever, it doesn't matter type of thing, but still having that ability to come into the office and collaborate and the workspace is probably looking a lot differently now. Do you, have you seen any companies that went all in on remote and then all of a sudden we're like, oh no, we kind of regret this. We want to go back and you know, we miss the collaboration of in-person type of settings, like anything like that, or like, what's your prediction of what that may look like? I've seen it more. I'm, I'm probably to not as much of a surprise, I've seen more situations where companies really want to turn the, the back in person back on as much as possible and as early as possible. 
and they were struggling on recruiting because they couldn't get people to commit to that lifestyle um, on the other side of COVID. So we had some companies pull back and be more flexible, especially at the leadership level. We've had some company, com some companies make a stronger stance on junior level talent where they feel like they need to be in the office more to be successful around potential mentors, group leaders, accountability in person. And like those in-person trainings will just go further for someone more junior where they were missing out. You start to get to that director, head of VP who say, Hey, like I can be there. I can be flexible, but I, maybe I don't, you know, live in the city or it's, I can only be here on this rhythm. They were initially passing on those cans like, oh, we'll find someone who, you know, is willing to, to get in here and be in here frequently. And, it, you know, you go one, two, two and a half months, get through 10, 12, 13, you know, VP level cans. And you, you start to you know, see the right in the wall, like, hey, like maybe we need a change. Um, I think to, to Maggie's point, the flip side of that is I haven't seen any companies who have gone fully remote um, feel like that was too firm of a stance. I do think that we're seeing a lot of those companies really double down on what makes a best in class remote culture. Because I do think a lot of them early on, a lot of businesses are trying to figure this out where you know, your, your talent's being approached, as we see in this report, like people are getting pinged constantly for new roles. So if you have an employee, if you have a fully remote uh, workplace and your employees are going through a couple of weeks of not feeling connected, not feeling like it's a great work culture, they may love your product, they love the company, the space, but you know, if you're going to be a remote company, you really need to develop that remote first culture because um, that's going to become the norm now, right? So it's like, okay, great, like, flexibility is there, but how are you still building that best in class culture? And culture is where it gets thrown around, like, oh, it's great culture, great people. No, it's like that connectedness that's going to really keep people in there. And that's hard to do remote. Um, people have to get creative and that's not just falling on the, you know, people HR function that's going really cross team into how you're building that as a business. So, so Maggie, if job seekers are evaluating companies based on their culture and it's remote, like what can companies do to instill that it is a great place to work? Like what, what, what are the candidates looking for as they're evaluating companies on their culture in a remote environment? Yeah, I think with culture and other criteria that candidates evaluate in a new opportunity, it's data to back up what the companies are preaching about um, and just some formalized way of explaining how the company operates remotely. I've seen some really great culture handbooks out there that companies will publish for anyone to see, not just for full-time employees, um, just about their values, how they operate, what's expected, um, and so on. I think that's a really great way to show candidates that you're committed to it. Um, I also think total rewards and it's, it's becoming a big part of culture in terms of um, benefits, and, and that's part of compensation as well, too. But um, candidates want to see the proof is in the pudding. It's a long story short there. Yeah, no, it's definitely a, a big piece. And so the, um, you know, everyone knows like the, the Netflix and HubSpot culture decks, but you're, so you're saying, you know, maybe create a smaller version of that, or at least have your careers page identify with job seekers. The other thing that the report talked about was um, consistency of the interview process, right? Like, so that everyone is on the same page as far as how they're communicating with job seekers that, you know, I think that would be a flag if I was interviewing and someone saying one thing, but the next person saying something completely different about the, the values or the vision of the company or the culture. Um, so I, I would think that that would be important is that consistency element throughout the interview process. Definitely. Um, we were a little surprised by this one, um, but candidates, biggest red flag is misalignment in the interview process. So they can spot it out more than you think. Um, Steve and I talk about this all the time. We probably sound like a broken record by now, but it's really important that before you start that search and that hiring process, you sit down with that interview panel and talk about what the goals for the hire are, the must-haves, the nice-to-haves, where you can be flexible and who's responsible for evaluating what, both in terms of skill set, but also culture and values. 
Um, and the more crystal clear you can get on that with your team ahead of beginning that process, the less hurdles you're going to have to deal with throughout um, that could ultimately cause you to lose a candidate if they're not able to be dealt with timely. Yeah, and I, I think that's the interview process. And you can even think about it more holistically of the company's overall employment brand, right? So what is their reputation, the transparency that lives and breathes out there in, a, in the Google search bar, what comes up after you type in those keywords. So what can companies do, you know, cause you don't know when that candidate's going to do their due diligence on the company. It could be before they hit the apply button or it could be right when they get an offer. I've seen it throughout all different stages of the, the life cycle. So what can companies do to build up that employment brand as an employer of choice? A lot, you know, I think a lot's going into this now. Um, I, I think candidate experience um, as related to like specifically recruiting what we were just kind of talking about in interview process is huge. So I think your culture and how you're known as a brand starts with that initial outreach and approach to the market. Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, could, like who you're connecting with, how they're going about reaching out to you and the messaging and making it personalized and how you're approaching them as a, as a person who could potentially work with a business is really reflective of, of kind of like your culture and like how you carry yourself as a business and who you want to engage with. So I think that was really important for us as we looked in the report. But, um, you know, I know I've obviously, as we talked about in the past, Keith, like some people want, you know, to learn earlier really what's going on with the business, want that transparency. I mean, there's things like Glassdoor out there where, you know, I think just with so many businesses out there, like it, like who can you trust on that now versus not? Um, some things can be dated versus up to date. It could be one person's experience. So they really want to understand like earlier on, like what they're walking into. Um, and so a lot of the, the pieces that, you know, we, we've seen companies do great with right now, um, earlier in the process is just being fully transparent on like where they are as a business, um, providing data more upfront around, you know, so you're getting into just like, Hey, like, and maybe that's signing NDA, but if it's sensitive and not every business can do that, but being really more transparent around like, Hey, like, here's where we are in a funding cycle. Here's where we're putting our time into, here's how this team's developing. Like, here's how, you know, we have to see people climb here. Like, here's not only like, why you're going to like our business, but how you could grow into a role at the company and what that looks like. So you're really trying to paint the image of a place where you can come and build your career versus just we're just trying to hire you for a role and rush you through and close a wreck. Um, so there's a lot that goes into an experience of trying to be that transparent of giving them as much data as they need up front, which is a good, you know, obviously positive indicator for your brand, your image. Um, and then also being completely transparent with them on just not only the role, but their growth, who they'd be interacting with um, in their time in the company. So on top of like, obviously all, all things you've seen, you know, you know, employers trying to get more vocal, um, you know, with, within their marketing teams and on LinkedIn and, you know, people posting on, you know, their, their progress and promotions or joining teams. I and mean, that's obviously all fundamental good things to do. But I think it goes beyond, I mean, like, again, to Maggie's point, proofs in the pudding, like, you want these people to feel like they're really going somewhere for their career, where it fully aligned, where they're going to be like behind the mission and not just take another step in their chapter. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think this and may I... be obvious, but the other big piece of it is living out what you're telling to these candidates and in, in your day to day of your job. Um, mm -hmm. As an employer, you like everyone knows that back channels are a great way to really get the, the full picture. Candidates know that too. And we see that more and more where candidates will back channel the company they're looking at joining and talk to past employees there, people that know other people working there. Um, and that's where they, they're really going to get the clear picture. So that's also misaligned with what's being said in the interview process. Um, candidates are going to are going to spot it out. Yeah, and I thought there was an interesting part in the process of that report where it was like, you know, um, go on the offensive. And if job seekers are going to do um, back channeling references of people that maybe worked there in the past, should you be on the offense and offer up references from its leaders of people that worked for those individuals in the past? Yeah, that was something really interesting. We've actually seen this come into play even this, you know, the past two quarters. 
more. Um, I thought it was a really interesting uh, data point in here where, you know, red flags interview processes back to that point um, where candidates were actually going through and back channeling the business earlier in their process and pulling out due to some of their findings. So, you know, if you're, especially at the leadership level and you're about to take, you know, a VP of sales role, for instance, like you're going to be working a lot with that VP of marketing or that VP of customer success and other people across the leadership team. Most people within certain spaces are going to have ties in their network or be able to find out about other people. So, you know, we've had candidates um, reach out and actually one recent example is they took the job because they said, hey, I've, I've done some poking around on you know, the VP of marketing. Like I've only continued to hear great things about their track record, how they work with sales in the past. Like I, one of my former reps um, also worked with this person and, you know, thought they were great and that, you know, that relationship between sales and marketing was so fluid and that's so rare to hear. We're like, wow, great. I had no idea you were even poking around. You know what I mean? So I think um, there's a lot you can do from a recruiter standpoint and giving them transparency and connecting them to folks. Um, you know, we've had more conversations where we've gotten board members involved earlier from the open view side on a portfolio business where they said, hey, not only here's like a you know quick context on the space and why we think this is you know potentially a winner and why we're excited, but also here's my you know uh, experience so far working with this business and how I how they think and how I've seen that evolve over time. So giving them their kind of you know perspective on certain leaders, individuals in the business. But I think your you know your point of going on offense and providing those reverse references, I, I would bet that becomes more of a, a normal trend in the future, um, you know, just given how competitive it is for, for people to, to close a candidate right now. Yeah, I think it's interesting how things change where it was always the employer doing references on the job seeker. Now, you know, the tide has turned where it's like, hey, I can check references on this company too. Just like investors, right? Before it was investors would do their due diligence on the entrepreneur, but entrepreneurs are much smarter now and they do their due diligence on the investor too. So uh, yeah. it's, it's just a leveling the playing field. Um, all right. So we all know it's a very tight market out there in that top of the funnel, like building your candidate pipeline, regardless of level and job function, it is so, so challenging. So if traditional methods like external recruiters, search firms, or posting jobs don't necessarily cut it anymore, like what can companies do to offset that top of the funnel issue? Yeah, this one was uh, really interesting. And I, I think Maggie and I have felt this directly, this given our, our you know, executing on executive searches still for, for the OpenView portfolio. Um, these data points jumped out. So, you know, obviously I think when people think of recruiting, especially at more senior levels, they think of um, executive search firms. And I, you know, I think that it was probably one of the hottest year or two for search firms. I think there was, it was pretty hot leading up to COVID. I think the brakes were slammed on for a few months there. If people figured it out. And then the other side of COVID, it was probably the hottest year for some executive search firms in terms of performance. And by one of the most challenging to even get an executive search firm to come in and do work for you. So I know um, we handle a lot of those relationships and we go to some of our, our search firms we have great partnerships with and say, hey, like we have this great portfolio company, they're growing like a weed, you know, they have to do a, a VP engineering search or a VP marketing search, like felt like this one would be great for you and the team. Awesome. Thanks for thinking of us. We're about two months out from being able to consider a new search right now. Like great, two months for that business is like a long time and to get in line, that's tough to hear, right? So, I mean, you, you look at that for your VP search. Okay, well, we can wait for them. They'll kick it off in two months. Probably have candidates in three. Maybe you're closing it in four or five. And we're seeing these, you know, times to close double, right? So now you're looking at six months out from potentially getting a, a leader where, you know, you were expecting that person to be hired and probably hire most of their team and, and now pushing towards other goals, right? So traditional methods between search firms and I think just like general internal recruiting teams, can't you can't rely on those anymore. I mean, you saw some of these preferred methods of outreach from the candidates. Um, at the top of the list was intros directly from VC or PE firms, CEOs or executives going directly and peer referrals. So I think that the 
the theme you're seeing in those three are the candidates or prospective candidates are actually incentivized to engage with those people. So a lot of people right now, like a great candidate, may not be not be looking, right? And I think that's you know a lot of people we talk to are not actively looking for roles. Some of them, of course, you know, you'll come across and like, hey, yes, I just started picking my head up. That's awesome for a bunch of different reasons. Some of them are like, you know, I'm, I'm not really looking to, to jump into a process. I do like meeting CEOs. I do like kind of keeping a pulse of what's out there. So engaging with a VC or PE firm is going to allow that candidate to broaden their network. It's going to allow them to learn. And, you know, with, with one VC, you have a whole VC's portfolio. So you're going to get a whole glimpse into other companies out there and make that connection for the future. So if they get on with myself, Maggie, or some of our investment team, you know, they're developing that relationship that's going to have a direct benefit to them, maybe when the timing's right. So VC is going directly, CEOs and executives, you know, again, a candidate's looking at a CEO saying, great, maybe it's probably good for me to broaden my network out with CEOs in a space that I'm interested in, executives, um, you know, again, the, that direct benefit to them, and then peer referrals. So you're going to probably bet on someone or trust someone's judgment that knows you to say, hey, like, I know you're probably not looking right now, but this business I got an exposure to, or I'm at this business now, like you should definitely speak with our VP of marketing. Like they're hiring. I think you'd kill it or come talk to our CEO. You're probably more inclined to jump on an intro call because the expectation set um, that you're going to, you know, that person you trust, it's an introduction and you, go, you take it from there. So you got to get creative. You got to leverage your network, you know, an internal recruiter blasting out hundred emails a day with some blanket, you know, paragraph about your business and some high level about the role isn't going to cut it, especially for senior level, level roles. So I've talked to founders before that were like spending time surfing through LinkedIn. And I'm like, oh my God, that blew my mind. Cause I'm like, it's only so many hours in a day and they're like sourcing. And I'm like, wait, so how do they, if a message should maybe come from the CEO, like, but how do you build out that pipeline of reach outs and should the CEO actually do that or should someone step in as their you know LinkedIn you know messenger or you know so like how do what's the most efficient way of getting kind of that sourcing list together and getting the outreach properly done Go ahead, Maggie. yeah um I think the initial sourcing strategy and pipeline build is a really important piece of your search that people often overlook, but it really starts with the CEO or the hiring manager identifying the top, let's say 25 or 50 companies that they really look up to in terms of hiring for this role. Um, so it's a similar go-to-market motion, it's a similar scale or problem that they're tackling. Maybe there's similar domain experience, but finding those companies where the people working there are going to be really relevant. Um, and then it does take some surfing around on LinkedIn, like you mentioned. Um, it can be time consuming. I think it's worth the time um, to kind of go broad and just see what's out there, get a feel for different flavors of types of profiles, where people's experience is coming from, the their kind of focus areas and what's going to be right for you. And use that time to really hone in on what your ideal profile is and how that lines up to people's actual experience. Maybe you're in your head, you've got this unicorn hire, um, but you can't find someone like that on LinkedIn. That's right there. You're starting to see that there's some misalignment. Um, so being really thoughtful upfront in, in who you're looking for, what criteria, again, is a must have versus a nice to have. Um, and then building like your target kind of initial pipeline of maybe 50 to 75 people. Um, and like the, the report said, I, I do think the CEO reaching out is, is really valuable and putting some thought into exactly why you decided to reach out to them and explaining that to them. Um, the more thoughtful you can be upfront, the more you're going to stand out when candidates are getting who knows how many messages a day on LinkedIn. Yeah. And I think if you are crafting a message that's very specific of why they're reaching out, I think it's why wouldn't you engage in a conversation if it's applicable, right? Obviously, um, you know, expanding your network and meeting a CEO is never a bad thing. Or if it's coming from the investor, like I, it would be very foolish for any job function to turn down a conversation with an investor because of that whole 
portfolio and you never know, you know, that network is so powerful. So uh, I think most people understand that. So if these, it's coming direct from the CEO, founder, or an investor, I think you're increasing those chances of that return reply. And is this, would you send the in-mail or try to hunt down their email? Like wh where do you think would be most beneficial? Because sometimes there's too many messaging platforms. And sometimes I'm like, I forget about LinkedIn messenger, like the messaging in-mail thing. So um, what's the best way to, to eventually you know, make sure they see it. Yeah, I think that's one. Steve and I probably wish we had the answer to. It just, yeah. it just depends. Um, I would say try both. Try a combination of both, because um, there's no way to tell who's using what. Yeah, it's, that's a tough one. We're seeing a lot of different ways to go about it. So you can send us a LinkedIn connection with a with a shorter note um, yeah. into why you want to connect. Once you connect with them, I think you do get access to their contact info. I think there's a lot of email scrapers out there that people use um, to get those. I think also like underrated, just look at someone's background and see who their you know, mutual connections. I think the people like that's like literally like one of the key points of LinkedIn and like its use cases. I think people really overlook that. Um, we do it for, you know, prospective companies, CEOs. And I think you look at it as a, a candidate, almost like as like a target customer. Uh, or target company you try and invest in like on the investment side, like you're looking at these people, like how do I break into them? Because I think the hardest part of search right now is literally getting qualified people to have a conversation. I think most companies are doing well once they get the at bat with the person, or at least from what we've seen on our recruiting side, I think some of the times the most challenging part of these searches is literally getting that one candidate you like on paper to get on a call, just to make a connection and, and learn a little bit more. Um, I think they, they there's a tendency to then move on to another conversation or at least have a follow-up where you can then say, okay, like if we had a shot, we, you know, that person didn't convert because this reason, um, or they did, you know, it was worth all that trouble getting on the phone. So like if you see someone in your network, um, or a friend of a friend or a connection of a connection, you know, that can help you get in there. It's worth pulling those cards because that might just be an easy lift for someone. You get on the phone, you might have your placement right there. Um, and I think what you know, Maggie alluded to a little bit is that these candidates are getting pinged constantly. Um, I had a I had a CMO candidate one time tell me that they had six offers at the end of their process. They spoke to over forty companies in their in their specific process to weed it down to ten to get you know all of these offers. Now, granted, they had a fantastic background. That's not going to be the case for everybody, but we wanted to pull that data out in this report. So we saw that. Um, the average candidate interviews with nearly eight companies before choosing, and most respondents interviewed at over 11. So if you think about, you know, how many outreach notes it took for that candidate to select those 11, probably double, triple that, there was some white noise around it, then they found something they wanted to engage in, and then, you know, even half that to where they wanted to really go spend time with, right? So if they're interviewing with five or six businesses at a time of those 11, that's a lot of conversations. They're meeting multiple team members. Their calendar is starting to fill up. So are they going to prioritize a business that's you know, sending some blanket email from a junior person on an internal talent acquisition team or not personalized message or someone connect from their network coming directly to say, hey, you should meet these people? Probably not. Have you seen any creative ways that companies have been able to engage their employees to provide referrals? Because that's obviously you know, a top way of finding great talent, but companies struggle sometimes with, you know, because you, know, you do the monetary incentive, but like what, what creative ways have companies that you've seen successful with the employee referral route? Yeah, I mean, as I said, my first reaction was going to say pay them um, and, and pay them even more than you were originally doing to incentivize them. One, one creative way um, that we've, we've seen we actually do it internally here at OpenView, but um, we're now kind of telling our portfolio companies about it is, so part of the, I think when part of the reason why employees don't think about their network is honestly probably part laziness where they're like, oh, like I don't no, no one comes to mind right now in the yep. 10, 30 seconds, I'm going to think about it. And then I'm going back to my day, right? Because it's not directly affecting me. You know, I think where, people underestimate how many people they know in their network 
and who they could know at the very least. So what we'll do um, at, at Open University, a lot of portfolio companies do this is we'll, there's an, there's a feature with LinkedIn where you could send everyone in the firm um, a preloaded advanced search in LinkedIn, anyone with basic LinkedIn. Um, you don't have to have like a LinkedIn recruiter seat or anything like that, basic LinkedIn can do this where you have like specific keywords or companies, you know, of, of people you're targeting or have those people auto-populated into the search and you send it to the employees and all they have to do is click on it and it will pop up and they can see mutual connections. They can see if there was anyone that they had in their network that fell into those titles. Um, if you're looking for a, you know, director of finance or a controller, they can, it will pull up all the controllers in their network specific, maybe do a location or things like that. And yeah, you may not have someone that's fine, but in the event you have three or 10, I mean, those are 10 prospective cans, right? That's uh, it's, it, it surprised people. And I think it's worked for actually some of our and open view hires to date where people didn't realize they were connected to some people in finance departments from old jobs that were perfect for a role. And I think you're totally now on it, Steve, because I think they, they have good intentions. It's just like, I don't know anyone and they go about their day, but if you're doing the work for them with that preloaded search query and they click on the link and it's like, oh, wait, it look, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that person. It just, it's going to be much better results. Um, and then I've seen some other recruiters, like in-house recruiters sitting down with each employee and actually like sitting down and breaking down their network with them one-on-one, -on -one. Um, you know, because everyone's hopefully working together to build the best company with the best talent to hopefully build something that's going to be a longstanding uh, company. So it's in everyone's yeah. best interest to, to help. Absolutely. And I think we've had people too. Um, part of this too, to think about it is proactive network building. So a lot of people look at it to a specific rec open at a company at any time. I think you have to also look at it holistically as a company, like here's teams, Here's the type of talent we like to attract. If you find someone in your network that you think is good for the business in general, refer them. Like there's like an incentive to like, you know, everyone, like we've had one company have, have an incentive to introduce five people. They don't need to be actively looking. They don't have to be, you know, perfect for an open rec right now, but introduce five people per quarter to the business, whether that be to another leader, talent acquisition, talent acquisition team, whoever makes the most sense for that person to learn more about the business. That's five more people you had that, you know, now know what your business is. Maybe that, you know, timing's great. They get excited. Maybe that's, you know, in a year in your growth, they're looking for something new and they want to, you know, they're interested in your business. Now they got to know you a little bit better. So also kind of take it more of as a network approach where there's maybe either, you know, financial incentive um, perks, you know, to introducing people to the, you know, potential people to the company things like that. It doesn't always have to be tied to a specific rec. Okay. Now, wh Maggie, what are you advising your portfolio companies about, you know, when should a company bring in their recruiting function in-house, like bring in the talent team, like the first recruiter to, okay, we're, you know, expansion stage scaling, you know, to hiring multiple recruiters. Are there like advice or best practices that you typically share with portfolio companies there? Yeah. Um, Steve and I and our whole talent team are, advising companies to do that sooner rather than later now. Um, the sooner you have someone in-house helping you with that, they're, they're also doing that proactive network building that Steve was just talking about. So it takes away the kind of transactional piece of search. And maybe like Steve said, they talk to someone, they're great, but timing's off. Um, that person will now have that connection with them for when the timing is right. Um, and I think just the earlier that you can build processes and um, programs for your recruiting function, um, the better equipped you're going to be to scale that as the company grows. Um, and it is a lot of work up front to build that foundation. So getting ahead of that, just like getting ahead of searches when it takes longer to do that um, is really important and effective right now. Yeah, I, I, just to add on, like I, the point about infrastructure and process is so key. Um, so I think that we have some of our earlier stage businesses where their mindset might have been, 
our functional leaders are great at recruiting. They brought a lot of their network. We're actually, you know, pretty close to hitting our headcount plan. We're using we're using agencies for particular functions. That's going well. Like that's great. Um, and you can strive towards that, but that's again not scalable. Because then when you get another round of funding, and you're like, okay, great, you know, now we want to go add forty people. Okay, are you are you equipped to do that? We have to go add sixty. You know, there's more that goes into it once you get to past that certain stage and things you aren't thinking about now. Just just basic blocking and tackling. Like, are you using the right ATS? Okay, you have an ATS. Great. Are people using it properly? Are people getting information in there? Um, who's holding interview teams accountable? You know, we saw the red flag misalignment across interview teams is, a, is the biggest red flag for candidates. Like, or do you have someone dedicated to each process to make sure everyone knows what they're doing? All the scorecard and assessment criteria is lined up. People providing feedback. People are getting candidates through a process efficiently. There's not getting slowed down due to scheduling issues or miscommunication or not you know, having the right people in the right place, right time. There's so much more that fundamentally goes into recruiting now to win top talent. Um, you know, if you have that one quarterback in seat, you're gonna you know, better position yourselves to, to do that and then allow them when the timing comes to scale up even faster to continue to build that team around it. Um, and I do think that, you know, we see the stats around engineering, you know, keeping people up at night, you can't get engineers. Go try a recruiting search right now. There's some of the hardest people to recruit in today's market. Like by by no means is it going to be like, oh yeah, let's go pull anyone in. Um, there's such a high demand for recruiting specialists to come in because all these companies growing and how competitive it is. So, you know, part of the reason for starting that process earlier too is you really want to get your leader and at least kick that process off because it might take you months to find the right person for your business because just how competitive it is to find those profiles. So uh, we have about a little less than 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go to some of the, the, the Q and a here. So if anyone has questions, feel free to add them into the Q and a function. Um, uh, one person asked, we were just talking about that LinkedIn search query and they were just asking like, how do you do that? Is that like a tool or is it just, you type in the query and you send a URL? Like how, how, how do you actually create what you were talking about, Steve? Yeah, we can send a follow-up with more of the instructions. It's it's more the um, the latter. Like you can preload a, a search um, in, into LinkedIn. And when you send it, they're going to have that auto-populated. Um, and LinkedIn does have instructions of how you can do that if you if you look through like different features. But it's actually not as complicated as you would think. You can preload a search, um, usually focusing in on like key titles locations and then you can add in some keywords if they're specific and that's just going to pull someone's entire um you know network of folks that they can that they can search through so uh, linkedin does have instructions on it laid out and then you know we can um also point people in the right direction if they have questions on a uh, question about interview process so you gave an example of a cmo who had talked to 40 companies and narrowed it down to 10 and received six offers how should a company think about running their process um you know because it just seems like you gotta hustle now um but you don't want to go too fast where you don't feel like you gave it ample time to you know make sure you're making the right hire on both sides so what advice would you have around that interview process and making sure it's aligned with what uh, is expected in the market today yeah i think maggie and i we always coach our portfolio companies on um if you found like 10 out of 10 cam paper and you wanted to bring them through the process, could you do that if you had to within two, two weeks, two business weeks? Um, and I think that could seem rushed to folks, but some of these A candidates, depending on where you get them in their cycle, like that may be how quickly they have to move. I'd say the keys there in setting up the process is back to what we talked about earlier in the session is really around alignment on the team. So that once someone is into your process, you know exactly what you're getting in each conversation. So you don't get to the end of that process and say, I feel like we didn't really get to know that person. Like the last thing you want to do in today's market is have five people on your team interviewing and then they're all asking similar questions. And then when other questions come up on the background, they go, well, I heard about their background. I dug in on some things that they're going to be working with on me, with me. And that's all I really got. You know, I spent 45 minutes with them. You want to avoid that. You want to be like, okay, we set up an interview process where everything we need to find out about that candidate is identified in that process. Understanding that 
those first two touch points with your company are not interviews. So we always recommend that the first 30 minute call is with someone where they're getting on and answering questions and selling, setting the hook. That's not going to change. If you get onto a first call, even with someone who's actively looking, you know, that's not the best experience because there's going to be so much they want to learn and see if this is the right opportunity for them to go in again, because they have 10 more behind it. They could go choose. So really invest the time up front on selling, give them the data they need, maybe earlier in the process, you know, have them sign NDA where you can share more specific things to make sure they are fully on the hook. Because once they're on the hook, it can then turn back into more of that traditional interview that everyone's used to and wants, where you're doing a lot more of the buying, not the selling. So it's the upwork front to get the selling motion down and things to do there. And then you can move quickly through your process, having to be really clear on, you know, how you're going to focus on that buy-in and, and actually interviewing. So another great question. So how do you get buy-in from uh, hiring managers? You know, the example is you've got a great partner who's willing to do whatever it takes. You know, they're like, hey, we need great candidates and they're doing content. They're, you know, dropping everything they're doing to go talk to a candidate, whatever they need. Yet then there's another bucket of uh, hiring managers that screaming for candidates as well, yet they're not really helping. They're not sharing job descriptions. They're just not, you know, so how do you get buy-in from the people that aren't really helping the in-house recruitment team do their job more effectively? Epic battle. I'll take a first stab, Matt. You can round it out. I, I would say um, a lot of the time I, I would, if I'm that recruiter, I would just do the work to really show that hiring manager on exactly what you need from them. So I think a lot of the pushback sometimes is if that person wants help, that hiring manager is really busy and like their mindset goes to like, well, you're the recruiter, like this is your job. Like I can help once I get candidates in, but the actual identification of candidates is not my responsibility. So I think that, you know, if you're going to ask people for help who have that mindset with recruiting, which, you know, no one wants a tattletale, but if you have someone, a hiring manager in that mindset now, they're not being a great hiring manager. They should know how competitive it is and do what they can to get the best people into the business. Um, so that's a, probably a different issue with them. But I would say if you have, say, your you know, 15, 20, 25 candidates as a recruiter, you're like, oh, if I could just get these 15 on the phone or to engage with you know, this hiring manager. And if, if part of your issue is getting back to like crickets, not here from cans, and you just want them to reach out or test their network, start with five. Say, hey, like I know like we, the last two weeks we haven't had any candidates. You know, I think here's why a lot of it's due to not response and non-responsive. Here's the 15 cans we think we could engage with to you know, to really solve this one. Our placement could be in these 15 candidates. Do you have time to send a note to these five? Here's the note. So all you have to do is send it. Here's their contact info. Here's ways we think we can get into it. So you have to do a little bit more of the hand-holding spoon feed. You do that once and that, you know, yields one or two candidates. They're likely going to, they're likely going to say, oh, well, that was pretty easy, low lift for me. Yeah, give me another five. I'll, I'll do it again, right? So like ease them into it. I think it's sort of where you're trying to the expectation of, I, we have this under control. We just need you to help with this. Just be very specific out of the gate. Yeah. Um, and I think what Steve's describing is, a really clear characteristic of an effective hiring manager is someone that's collaborative and is asking how they can help throughout that process and talking with the recruiter and really co-partnering on the strategy to get someone in the door. Um, so I think that's a good anecdotal data point to share. I'd be, I stand by that one. If they're asking how they can help and doing that follow-up throughout the process, um, that's a good sign. Got it. Well, we're already out of time. Like we could have spent hours on this, obviously, <laughs> um, but that was incredibly helpful. Steve and Maggie, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through all the details of the report and all this useful information, because it is just such a challenging market. We're all in this together, trying to figure it out. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn. If anyone wants to connect and we're not already connected, just send me an invite. Happy to accept. Um, and like, I didn't talk about venture fizz on purpose. I save that for the end. But if you don't know about us, we're an employment branding and recruitment website. So if you are looking to build up your employment brands, we are a website that is focused on the tech industry. So we help you create the content, the videos, podcasts, 
obviously there's job descriptions on our job board, there's company profiles. So we're, we're your one-stop solution for that employment branding piece, which um, we work with a lot of the great companies from the open view portfolio. So, all right, Steve and Maggie, thanks again for taking the time. Appreciate it. And everyone, thanks for joining us and uh, awesome. we'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.